you know, actually the kind of the exploitation of the planet is you know so closely linked with the exploitation of people. You know, the environmental crisis, you know, perhaps is better described as an environmental justice crisis. Welcome to The Green Urbanist, a podcast for urbanists fighting climate change. I'm Ross. You're very welcome to The Green Urbanist podcast with me, Ross O'Kelly, the podcast which explores how built environment professionals can rise to the challenge of the climate crisis. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Jane, Lydia and Tom of DSDHA, an architecture and urban design studio based in London, to talk about their new research project called Towards Spatial Justice, a guide for achieving meaningful participation in co-design processes. In this episode we have a really great chat, Uh, these three are are all really good storytellers um, and they really bring this topic to life with a lot of examples from their work. And we talk about what code design is, what that really means as a process, why it's important, and how they've applied that in projects like Whitehorse Square in Wembley Park, near the the famous Wembley Stadium, uh, and the extension of the British Library. When we did this recording a couple of months ago, the research project wasn't live yet, but happy to say that it is now live on DSDHA's website, and there's a link to that as well in the episode description. Um, really nice, succinct, illustrated report. So do uh, go and check that out and have a look. As always, if you'd like to see visuals of the projects we're talking about, you can follow the link in the episode description. Uh, that will take you to my Substack blog, which is greenurbanist.substack.com, where you'll be able to see Uh, images of the projects we talk about but also consider subscribing to that you can just pop your email address in and subscribe and that means you'll get an email every time there's a new episode or every time um, I share something on Substack so I also write articles there and share useful things so it's a way of just getting access to more of this this, uh, and similar content and finally just to say if you're enjoying this episode if you're enjoying the podcast in general Probably you have a friend or a colleague who would also enjoy it, and it really helps me out if you share that with them directly or if you share it on social media and feel free to tag me, uh, Ross O'Kelly, and the podcast, Green Urbanist Podcast, in that. Um, Yeah, and it it would be lovely to hear from you and would be great to hear that you're uh, benefiting from these conversations. So enjoy the podcast. Can you please uh, start by just telling us uh, who you are? I'm Tom Greenall. Uh, I am a director of DSDHA. Uh, I also teach um, architecture at the Royal College of Art. Um, and I, I'm also a, kind of a member of the steering group of Architects Declare. Hi, I'm Jane Wong. Um, I, I'm an architect working across public realm landscape projects and a lot of research work here at DSDHA. I also teach uh, in UCL in two courses um, and um, have been conducting this piece of research with um, Tom and Lydia uh, towards spatial justice, which we'll speak about later on in the podcast. And I'm Lydia Hyde. I am an urban designer um, and researcher at DSDHA. Um, And I have a background in working with Central St. Martins to figure out how we can co-design with um, local authorities, students and local community groups. Okay, great. Well, you, you've, you've set us up for our topic really nicely there. So we wanted to talk about uh, that piece of research that you're doing, um, some REBA-funded research. Um, yeah, who wants to, do, maybe Jane, do you want to start off telling us a bit about it? Um, so this piece of research came at the back of um, a bunch of projects at DSDHA. Um, so uh, we worked on uh, several public realm projects um, where there was a co-design component. Um, and we were trying very hard to figure out how we communicate that process to different audiences, be it the participants themselves or clients, etc. cetera. Um, and that dovetailed with um, teaching um, at the LSA, London School of Architecture, um, that Deborah led with a few others from the studio. Um, They had a focus on spatial justice um, and were sort of 
located in Hackney. Um, Hackney is the main site of focus, and part of that work uh, that the students did in the think tank uh, was to develop an assessment tool of community engagement practices. Um, and that sort of coalesced with the practice work that we were doing, and we pitched uh, the, the idea to the RBA um, to do a piece of research on um, sort of articulating that process, um, articulating its value, uh, the pragmatic um, pragmatics of it, um, but also to create an overlay um, to the RBA plan of work. Um, and that also led to uh, some tools that we developed um, in collaboration with uh, a fantastic network of people. Uh, we were very conscious that you know this co-design research could only really exist in dialogue with um, others. So we reached out to different practitioners in uh, the public sector, private sector, working across master plans, community engagement, um, public realm projects. Um, and uh, really these um, conversations and dialogue led to um, a sort of consolidation of you know, all this work into a report, but also um, emerging strategic work that we're trying to do with um, local authorities and uh, the GLA, uh, the Greater London Authority. So that's the sort of summary of that research. Um, but maybe Tom can speak to the genesis of it more. Um, I could try. <laughs> that, was, that was great. Well, I, I guess just maybe to put it in context slightly, um, uh, so DSDHA, the company we work for, um, originally it st stands for uh, the initials of the founding directors, so mm -hmm. Deborah Sorn, David Hills, Architects. Um, now we're more just a kind of acronym, um, uh, but we, I guess some of our earliest work was uh, we're working with schools, working with children's centres, um, and a theme that kind of kept coming through with all of these projects was the kind of connection between uh, people and landscape. And these projects were all in um, kind of, you know, the fringes of, you know, the London A to Z, uh, kind, of, kind of edge conditions and... Uh, places like Barking and Dagenham, where um, yeah, at the time there was some money going into the development of kind of new school building programs, um, and we kind of you know through these projects we sort of uh, recognised that we had this kind of fascination with landscape, um, connection to nature, um, and that has over the last I guess uh, nearly twenty years um, become you know, embedded in a kind of design methodology that we've developed, mm -hmm. um, and I guess that kind of means that with every project we always look beyond the client brief, beyond the kind of the boundaries of a site, um, to consider the wider uh, social, cultural and environmental implications of the stuff we do. Um, and I think that um, over the course of lockdown in particular, when we were all kind of trapped at home, um, there were various kind of challenges that we all faced and we faced with our projects and how to engage communities in the work we were doing. Um, that exposed uh, kind of multiple injustices that we um, uh, recognised. The kind of, I guess you know are the potential for our work to um, engage with, um, but also at the same time, I guess we recognised the kind of complicity of what um, you know we do in uh, sort of compounding some of these injustices. Um, so we started um, we started using the term spatial justice as a, a kind of a, a word to capture um, what we were setting out to um, achieve through our, our projects. So I guess spatial justice for us uh, was intended to capture the intersectionality of, of health justice, kind of social or kind of race justice, um, uh, and also uh, you know, things like the cost of living crisis, impacts that they were having on people, mm -hmm. um, as well as environmental justice. Because um, I think that we... You know, whereas you get lots of practices that perhaps um, are kind of, can adopt a more dogmatic approach to sustainable design by saying, it's, it's, oh, we'll only do this, we'll only do that. Um, I guess we became aware through some of the contexts that we were working in that um, you know, actually the, kind of the exploitation of the planet is you know, so closely linked with the exploitation of people. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's obviously been said lots of times before, but um, you know, the environmental crisis... You know, perhaps is better described as an environmental justice crisis. It's a child's rights crisis. It's a 
uh, you know, female safety crisis, it's a kind of health crisis. Um, and so by targeting or recognising um, uh, that the work we do can uh, address those multiple injustices, as a consequence we are developing more sustainable work. Um, so we, through this research um, that's you know, called Towards Spatial Justice, we're trying to position uh, participatory design and co-design as a tool um, uh, that can help architects recognise um, that kind of intersectional relationship. Not just architects, I guess that's the point. It's, it's about um, uh, sharing uh, you know, knowledge, sharing expertise, sharing agency over the built environment with those that are um, involved with it. Mm. Um, involved with it as, as users, as inhabitants, as uh, kind of occupants of the city um, in order to uh, empower those people to help make decisions. Yeah. So I think it's kind of the, what we try to set out is that um, uh, you know, spatial justice is achieved by recognising the process through which the built environment is formed rather than uh, trying to assess the product of uh, mm. architectural practice. Yeah, that's that's quite profound, and I think as you know, it's a very systemic perspective, which I really appreciate. And I think we'll we'll come back to how that sort of manifests in a in a real project. But maybe just for people who are maybe unfamiliar with some of the terms, what what do you sort of mean by co-design in this process? Like just in, in terms of the basics of that. Well, I mean, interesting. So the three of us are sat here. We've we've worked together for a few years now, but we first met Lydia. Um, when she was a student of Central St Martins, um, and she was kind of pioneering a, an approach to engagement and code design at the time. So you're probably best. <laughs> nice deflection. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think the the defining and the definition of code design was something that the three of us worked on very early on in the spatial justice research report. And then it's a term that is often thrown around and yeah. used in very different degrees of um, authenticity and success. Um, yeah, to be fair. Um, so for us, that was a really important part of the process at the beginning was to think about how can we draw together lots of different definitions of co-design and provide a framework which looks at producing a process that is... Um, I mean, first of all, accessible for all, inclusive for all, mm. um, that it represents the diversity of the area in which you're designing for. Um, and something that came up in our interviews was um, that often in engagement processes, it's often the loudest voices that are heard the most. Um, and that is something, and if co-design is taken on as a very quick process, that's something that's not always acknowledged and made right. So co-design, how can we look in that process for voices that are often underrepresented or underheard. Mm. Um, and I think for us as well, another thing that emerged from our research was that co-design um, shouldn't necessarily be boxed into the time frame of a specific project. And if you are engaging with people and starting to build relationships, those relationships need to be long term. Mm. And a lot of pain and um, negative feelings towards co-design comes when designers or local authorities come into a situation, plonk themselves in there um, and just take what they can get from that time period. Mm -hmm. And the most effective form of co-design is where it's really an embedded practice that lo yeah, lasts a long, longer than the project itself mm -hmm. and is iterative in its nature. Yeah, one, I mean, one of the kind of formative bits of, uh, I guess, reading or kind of uh, research we did was into the work of Shelley... Arnstein, mm. wasn't it? So Shelley Arnstein was a, I guess... Activist, a, academic. Activist, yeah, mm. good description. But she developed this um, ladder of participation that explains, um, I, I guess it's a really useful tool to look at, uh, or to kind of use it as a framework for assessing different projects as well. So whereas I think the, the criticism of, you know, uh, lots of consultation mm. is that it is, you know, it's extractive, it's one way, mm. um, it is, it's lip service... Um, it's uh, used to maybe inform people of a development coming along um, and to collect feedback but not necessarily respond to the feedback they give. So that's kind of the, you know, the lowest level of participation. As you climb up that, it's, you know, uh, it involves you know, sharing skills, sharing knowledge, involving people in... And co-design almost is a kind of uh, in, inadequate description of what we're talking about because actually that's not design you imagine is part is just you know come and help us design a project mm. actually it's about help us design the brief for the project help us decide whether the project 
you know, uh, should exist. Um, you know, even as fundamental as that. Yeah. Um, and it's that kind of, uh, it's through that process that people can become engaged, people become equipped with uh, the tools and the language to, to talk about, um, you know, the built environment. And I guess with the ladder, we were trying to map um, different forms of community engagement against the different rungs of the ladder. So it goes from manipulation, consultation, all the way to citizen control. And the sort of community engagement or consultation as we know it usually sits in the middle range or the lower middle range. Um, and usually that's also because of the timing of it, that it usually starts at RBA stages two and three. So, you know, towards already, you know, when the design has some sort of resolution and is less loose for um, change. Um, and so with co-design, I guess we're trying to map it out against the higher rungs or the highest rung of the ladder, which is citizen control. And that distinguishes co-design to, com well, uh, typical community engagement practices mm -hmm. Uh, where, uh, yes, maybe there is um, a, a collective effort in designing, but then, um, crucially, you know, the power isn't shared um, or the knowledge isn't exchanged. So I guess, uh, like, we, we tried to sort of come together with a definition of co-design, and for us, at least in the context of the research, um, it is to design collectively, yes, um, but then also thinking about agency, so how to share power and whether that's through governance, through charters, uh, through project stewardship, um, and then through to the exchange that Lydia spoke to, the exchange that takes place before the actual co-designing process and after, so safeguarding the longevity and the legacy of the project. Um, so, yeah, and with, I guess... Uh, partly coming back to Lydia's initial point about co-design, the term being thrown around, um, we were trying to unpack the different activities within co-design um, against the RBA plan of work. So we, we tried to use co-design as an umbrella, but then that splits into the co-creation um, of the overall strategic work, the co-production of a brief, the actual co-designed process of stages two and three, and then co-delivery, which um, Tom can maybe speak to later, which is an emerging thing, um, and finally co-evaluation, which is not usually understood as even an important stage, right? Yeah. Um, but then throughout sort of our conversations with many practitioners, actually that is um, a really exciting and creative stage um, where your work is being tested um, in real life. And that informs, you know, the stages zero and stages one of other projects. So, yeah, I, I guess that's... Um, Maybe, yeah, th long some of... Answer long question. answer to a short question... <laughs> Um, well, it, sh it shows you how, I suppose, complicated it can get. And I think you're right, there is a risk that these words end up becoming sort of buzzwords mm -hmm. that, that yeah. don't really hold, hold the value. And I suppose, is there, mm -hmm. is there, is there examples in research? I mean, presumably the, the purpose of co-design is that not only is it a good thing to do, you would hope the outcome is better than mm -hmm. for everyone involved because you've gone through that process. And is that something that you find, is there good research on that or good data on that? Um, <laughs> mixed I would say mm. um, I think I mean one of the obstacles that we've come up against is that um, even the people that are um, you know supporting us do this work still um, you know uh, in informal conversation will say that you know this is just a, a, a kind of a version of you know mm. the big society model where you know control was handed over to communities without paying them without giving them proper um, training to do it it's just about um, it's just a, another hoop to jump through to uh, achieve plan permission on a building, um, and it doesn't. You know, people are not uh, equipped uh, or skilled enough to design these things. So I think there is still a problem that um, uh, too much emphasis is placed on whether the product that emerges at the end is better mm. than the product had it not happened. Um, and yes, that should be. That's a valid criteria for assessing 
it, um, but I think the criteria for success need to be better defined. Because um, I think there's too much emphasis, obviously, on um, you know, appearance. You know, on the classic kind of cost, quality, uh, how long the process took kind of matrix, um, when in fact uh, it perhaps should be better assessed on whether um, it achieves, whether the community is an agency, okay. whether, um, you know, even on whether the uh, there's been less animosity in the process of, of delivering something, um, whether you know, the number of people that have been engaged, the number of people that knew about it happening, the number of people that... Um, you know, will claim ownership of it. And, and perhaps, again, something that can't be assessed till you know, many, many years down the line. Yeah. When you say, you know, are these people still taking ownership of it? Are they still, you know, maintaining it? Or is mm-hmm. it serving its process? So um, there's, there's, there's lots of people kind of um, really trying to push uh, this. I think we're still at quite early stages of, um, you know, having a kind of a critical framework for um, evaluating it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's interesting, yeah. And in, t- in terms of the actual research project, so you said it was based in Hackney. Was there a site in particular you were looking at, or was it? So that was um, the Hackney uh, case was tied to the LSA work um, in the London School of Architecture, spatial justice think tank. Um, so the students were, um, well, they they coined it hacking Hackney. Um, <laughs> A really, uh, really great group of uh, students who um, really come together to sort of identify the unheard voices, um, local groups that are either evicted or at risk of being evicted, um, and also the whole sort of legacy of various different projects that happened in Hackney over the past two decades, um, whether it's the more public realm-focused projects, um, or um, the new council housing um, that has been developed. So um, that was a very rich uh, ground for sort of them evaluating the projects that have happened, but also to propose um, tools to sort of um, preempt the future processes that are taking place, um, that will take place. So, yeah, the, the, Hackney, um, the Hackney work uh, led to... Um, us really taking on this idea of, um, yes, there's so many of these uh, projects and, you know, collaborative practices, you know, can we find a way to um, sort of consolidate the lessons learned, um, but also to uh, develop something quite concise for accessibility. So like if if um, we were to develop a tool that can be used by, you know, community members themselves, Um, rather than uh, architects. So skipping the sort of um, practitioner, um, the professional practitioner in the process. So um, that was partly the context of this research. Um, But I guess that's related to other projects um, that were actively um, carrying out co-design at that time at DSDHA. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, like, yeah, you're right. These things were all sort of coalescing around the same point, and um, I think there was a, there was a kind of general sense in the air, wasn't it? Of um, uh, there's a lot going wrong at the moment in the world, and um, there was all this con- everything was deemed as kind of like you know, pre- pre- let's say pre-pandemic, it was like ev- there was always the kind of like you know that's not possible, that's not achievable, mm. that's not viable yeah. in architecture. The idea of viability was so embedded within. Um, uh, you know the culture of planning and things like that that um, it was considered almost like sacrosanct you couldn't question it you know, the government said there's not funding for this not funding for that mm. pandemic comes along next thing we know we're living in a society where we've got furlough we've got kind of support for businesses and suddenly things that we were previously told weren't possible um, were and I guess that gave us the impetus to say well maybe we kind of push that kind of like mm. the envelope of what is considered possible um, by trying to open up these conversations. So whilst the LSA, the work with the, the LSA think tank was going on, we were also working with um, a practice called Roger Sturk Harbour um, on an extension to the British Library. Mm-hmm. Um, and the site for this extension is one that's been earmarked you know, since the library was, was built. The library that exists at the moment is only you know, a proportion of the original oh, really? um, designed by... Um, uh, Colin St. John Wilson and MJ Long, there was uh, 
uh, I think the process took so long and was so expensive at the time that you know there was a whole other half you know it was never developed. Um, this site up out the back of the library where it was allocated for the development of this um, extension had you know as a, a kind of a meanwhile use been occupied by um, a really amazing group called Global Generation who set up gardens. They kind of work in um, collaboration with lots of developers or landowners to occupy sites um, that are kind of temporarily available. Um, temporarily available. And so they, uh, the British Library site, they set up what was called um, the Story Garden. Um, they had another one in, or uh, well, they've got another one in Calendar Water, uh, the old kind of printing, mm. printing press, which is called the Paper Garden. Um, and they used these gardens to um, provide effectively like allotment space for um, the local uh, the local population. They're often areas that are where there's a kind of deprivation in terms of open space. Um, but they also provide training in kind of horticulture, food growing, uh, kind of uh, sustainable or um, self-sufficient ways of living, which become particularly important in uh, you know, pandemics or in kind of cost of living crises. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, and they had such a kind of like a, a an important impact on the local area. They weren't just providing a garden on the site, they were providing a sort of outreach service. So they'd go into um, all of the, the kind of the blocks around Somerstown, the area uh, in which the British Library sits, um, and they'd you know plant flower beds there, or they'd print, print, uh, plant um, uh, allotments or vegetable patches. So they'd support you know the community beyond that garden. And it just seemed, um, that you know, whilst you know the British Library National Institution does really great work, fantastic stuff. So there has to be a space within the project mm. to retain something like this. Um, so with them, or rather, I think they they kind of coined the term, um, but it was a really kind of uh, kind of significant moment in the project. They spoke about this idea of a hub and spoke model. So the moment the garden on the site was the the hub, and they'd started creating these spokes out in the community. Um, and there was just the idea that over the course of the, the design of this extension, the hub can get smaller, the spokes can get longer mm. and bigger and more significant. Um, so the, I guess the, the, the work that we did involved building a kind of, or including within the landscape of this extension to the library, a community garden. Mm. Um, and uh, But the word community garden is applied to so many things things and um, there's always kind of uh, you know necessary cynicism that labeling something a community garden um, is again a, a kind of an attempt to um, uh, achieve something without putting in the hard work of mm. making it um, community owned community managed um, so we will um, be embarking over the coming years um, on a co-design exercise for this garden with the local community um, that will include conversations about the governance of that garden, ownership of that garden, key holders for that garden. Um, key holders, not literally, but I, you know, the idea mm. of who, who will steward it, what can they do with it, what are the possible uses. Um, and hopefully it will work as a kind of space in dialogue with the British Library. Um, so spaces within the building will provide dry indoor space for teaching and learning. The garden itself will continue to provide outdoor space that kind of the community, but also school groups can come to to learn. Um, but within this process, that was yeah. We ha- we we've um, almost our commission. A large part of it was to develop the framework for this process. Um, what would be considered? What would be the timescales that uh, would deliver a, a successful process? Um, but I guess the kind of the interesting point within this, or one 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 interesting point is, is that when it comes to planning, um, you know, rightly so, planners want a plan of the design uh, to sign off sure. and this is a huge project this British Library um, scheme um, includes gallery space includes conservation centre includes um, uh, a learning centre uh, includes a huge foyer that will be publicly accessible and it includes um, lab space for um, uh, uh, kind of uh, science kind of knowledge quarter um, tenants um, uh, and as well as that includes uh, all of the necessary uh, kind of infrastructure for the potential cross rail station that will come through oh. the bottom of the building. Um, so this is like a you know, seven year build. You can't co-design a project now um, mm. that is not going to see the light of day for another seven years and expect the community to still be um, you know, have the same you know, wants, needs, desires, kind of aspirations for the site. So it was like you know, the question became like, how can we put a kind of you know, ring fence this on a plan? 
that gets permission mm. that just says, you know, TBC. Um, <laughs> yeah. which, I, which I think is a really important kind of um, thing to recognise, that um, some of the kind of regulatory frameworks or kind of uh, um, the ways in which things are done don't allow for um, the process to operate in the way that it would most effectively operate for um, uh, the people we're trying to engage with. Mm. So a lot of this work has been inspired by the fact that we have to question uh, those standard... Uh, plans of work that architects mm. work to or or standard kind of time scales or kind of protocols that developers want us to operate in. Yeah. Um, and that requires kind of you know discussion with local authorities about, you know, this is our intention. Can we provide a charter for what this space will be? Um, a uh, description and a kind of a, a time scale for the process that we'll undertake um, rather than so can we can you, you give us permission for the process, not for the product? Yeah. Um, and right. in the case of the British Library, that has been, uh, and you know, the really kind of great work of Camden Plan Department in this case, um, yeah, has been something that they've been keen to um, you know, pursue with us. That's fascinating. One thing that um, really stuck out uh, for me in that process was something that someone said just off the hand, but it's always stuck with me, um, is that 10 years is a really short amount of time in this time scale of a development yeah. but 10 years is a really long time in the lifespan of a child growing up in summer's town yeah. Yeah. so you know if this project is going to take seven years in construction what can architects or designers do in the meantime to put in temporary interventions temporary things to yeah. say that we are listening we are acting on what you said and the outcome will be long yeah. but in the process of people actually living there day-to-day -day lives in the area and dealing with this development, what can we do to put in things in a meanwhile basis to provide in that meantime space? I, th I think that's like such a source of frustration for communities who, who end up doing a lot of engagement or, or, or that kind of, you know, stuff. Like I've been involved with engagement around local plans, mm. you know, for, for local authorities. And you, you go in with all this energy being like, you know, you get to have your say, how do you want this place to be shaped, all that kind mm. of stuff. Tell us what you want. But then, you know, it, go, it takes three years for it to get through the inspector and then, mm. you know, then it's a policy and nothing actually, you know, manifests. Yeah. You know, and there's yeah. no promise that anything will manifest. It's just trying to steer development going forward. And I think, like, if we can have the long, medium and short term timescales with, with projects attached to them, I think that could help communities to actually be more democratically involved with planning mm. and shaping their places because like as you said with, with this one about the, the community gardens that kind of thing like often it's communities who will if they can get access to these spaces that are sort of forgotten about mm -hmm. they do amazing things with them and, yeah. and that like yeah. really builds the community resilience mm -hmm. and all that stuff that we need to be doing more you know coming into climate change yeah. and all this kind of stuff so I think a lot of time do, do you feel like a, often it's about getting out of the way of communities to just do what they, they want to do I mean yes yeah and I think even it's some yeah I would I mean we've all had degrees of kind of cynicism about how well these processes <laughs> can work when um, uh, they're funded by you know developers who's you know, you know perhaps developers who still want at the end of the day to do a development yeah. um, or when they're at the uh, whim of kind of other kind of political powers yeah. um, you know consultation engagement is something that is frequently kind of weaponized um, in you know, even public sector work um, uh, weaponized or kind of misused um, to justify uh, mm -hmm. certain decisions that are made. We're constantly told this is what the people want. <laughs> it's like, mm, well, which people and do they all want it? It's like, no. It's, so anyway, that I think, um, uh, yes, sometimes it is about getting out of the way. I also think um, sometimes uh, it's it, it, reflection on what you're learning in the process is really important. Mm -hmm. So with the again with the British Library project, when you say okay, so what should be the charter for this space? It's the British Library, it's a national institution. It also has to act as a local library for um, uh, the, this unique uh, uh, place in London, which for years has been kind of hemmed in by you know, Euston on one side, St Pancras on the other side, Euston Road to the south, you know, one of the most polluted roads in London, mm -hmm. and then the canal to the north. It's this kind of island which has been kind of severed from um, other locations and surrounded by infrastructure that makes you know, the air polluted. 
do you think well that's got to be a place that is um, you know, accessible to everyone it's got to be inclusive um, it's got to take into consideration design for um, neurodiversity it's got to be biodiverse it's got to be sustainable it's like you kind of set this agenda and you're like well if that's the process for the co-design that we'll do with the community um, then why is that not the process that we're adopting for the design process within the design team mm. like why do we have these kind of um, uh, you know, certain kind of uh, baked in expectations of what it's like to go through an architecture project um, why can't we kind of step back and say actually what if we all consider within you know this group of professionals um, each other's um, uh, forms of neurodivergence or you know meeting times like and especially in lockdown it was like you know even within the team different people had different levels of you know wi-fi accessibility so therefore a different ability to engage in meetings um so in the process of trying to think how can you make this a kind of a, a really successful inclusive engaging process in terms of like the language you use or the languages that you translate the material into mm. um even funny things like we we realized through the process thanks to the kind of the kind of engagement team at the British Library that um, large proportion of people in Somerstown will be accessing kind of online consultation via 4G on their phone, mm. not via a laptop with Wi-Fi. So therefore any image, any kind of text you provide should be able to be read, you know, so if you're showing slides, yeah. um, don't expect that everyone's looking at it on a big screen like we have in this room. They're accessing the internet in a kind of variety of ways. So I think that um, uh, get out of the way as you say, it's like is definitely uh, a really valuable thing, but also uh, don't get too far out of the way that you can't hear and then reflect on it. <laughs> <laughs> then you can't yourself learn some lessons about the stuff you know. Yeah, like practice what you're preaching yeah, yeah, within yeah. your own processes. I think is the that's really good. Yeah. Is a good thing. It's a very um, humbling process as well, and yeah. I think it needs yeah. to be. So I feel like it's two sided. It's getting out of the way, but also acting on recognizing your positionality and privilege mm. as a designer coming into this space and actively giving that up in the process to give other people a voice. Mm. Um, and I think that's often, well, that's something that came up in a lot of our conversations through the research, um, was how can we humble ourselves to give other people the voice? So I think it should be active, it's getting out of the way, but also being proactive in the way that we do that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, we all get sort of wedded to our, our initial ideas on a project, yeah. you know, and it's really hard to let go of those when you realise maybe that's not what <laughs> the community is calling for. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes the kind of the most profound bits of feedback or the most thing, the things that most profoundly affect a project are things that are said so, um, uh, like, off the cuff <laughs> by someone or a group of people in these meetings. Um, or in these uh, meetings, it's the wrong word. Like, we did a session for a project that we might talk about a little bit more um, in uh, near Wembley Stadium, um, where we were working with a group of young people from Brent. And, um, you know, the kind of the process was, you know, we'll do a big walk on the site. We'll then, you know, invite them to our office and talk about how we approach public realm design, landscape design. Then we'll, you know, they'll develop some ideas, proposals. Um, and then we'll go and map these things out literally physically on the site to help understand scale and um, and things like that. But actually the kind of the, the greatest contribution to the project was something that this group of young people said, you know, day one, they were like, We just want this to be judgment free space. Wow. Um and it and it's in in a sense it's like, of course you do. Um but actually you think more about it and you're like and you realise that that, and they say what they mean by that, and it's like, well, if we sit outside in some furniture outside a cafe, um, people treat us as being antisocial because we're not, we can't afford to buy a drink. Yeah. If we sit in a playground, people treat us as antisocial because we're above the age of eleven, and therefore like must be causing trouble. Um, so just expose that there is, you know, young people, like let's say kind of like fourteen to eighteen, even even slightly older. Um, really are um, excluded from um, participating in the public realm. And they said that, you know, lots of these people were at an age where they're like, we still, you know, we'd actually quite like to go to a space that has swings or that yeah, has things yeah. like that. You know, we're not too old to enjoy sitting on a swing. Um, but so therefore the design of that swing should be one that um, uh, looks like it's been designed for you know, mm. a young adult as opposed to a child so that there won't be this perception that by being there they are... Um, doing something that is wrong, um, and equally, like you know, they they spoke about the idea that perhaps colour is also key to that. In that, primary colours, it suggests 
um, young children. If it's mm. not, it's just kind of you know, adult play. Like you see emerging yeah. with these adult kind of gyms in parks and things like that. But it was that really, in a sense, after that point, they were like, yeah, it's judgment free. And then, you know, we all threw around lots of ideas. And these ideas evolved through working with us and us kind of um, help them to show how we would draw them up and 3D model them. Um, but that judgment free thing just became the only framework we really needed to assess uh, any decision. And in the bit where we've had to, had to do like you know, the technical design on these things, still you can apply that to it. And when there are compromises, like is that kind of like well, that is that safe? Is that what? So is it judgment free? Is actually the only criteria? And you find and you apply that to um, uh, uh, everything. It's like even you know if you put planting there, is that likely to get damaged? And therefore, will there be a kind of uh, insinuation that mm. the use of the space has led to has damaged the planting? Blah blah. It's just it was. It was so valuable as a, a thing. It's not, you know, in itself, it's not, it wasn't mm -hmm. profound, but actually it's had a profound impact on um, yeah. how the process has subsequently played out. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. Thank you, for, thank you for sharing that example. And I think that whole thing of, like, the way we are allowed to move and use our bodies in, the, in urban space is mm -hmm. very codified. And I think what's invisible to us a lot of the time is that children are meant to play, mm -hmm. teenagers are meant to do sports, and adults are meant to work out. Yeah, and yes, that's the sort of yes. and there's you know there's a sort of thing where actually if you saw an adult in a playground you'd probably call the police. But it's like yeah, there's lots yeah. of adults who would love to have access to swings and mm. you know playful movement like that. We yeah. don't we don't stop enjoying that stuff. It's just for me that was completely yeah. the thing. I was like, they said this. I was like, yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> you know, those rare occasions where there is something where you can sit up so you're like, yeah, I'm definitely yeah. I'm. <laughs> but I mean, I guess we should say that um, this process was uh, we were working with. Um, uh, Julia King, who's an architect, uh, kind of academic researcher based at the London School of Economics, um, and she was sort of funded by the the developers Quintain who own that whole Wembley Park area, mm -hmm. and she'd been embedded in that area for quite a while. So she kind of formed the group. She'd established all these connections, um, and what was I think I learned a lot from the process was that she just had this um, a really great kind of attitude for being like. You know, these are, these are um, uh, let's let's give people more credit rather than less. Well, let's assume that people <laughs> can take more responsibility rather than less. Um, these people, everyone should say, it's fine. We're just like, we can all Zoom each other and catch up on these things. And it was like, yeah, we'll just have a normal professional meeting, mm -hmm. um, but with these, you know, this kind of uh, and group paid, of young people. So and they were paid. Critically, she, she enforced the kind of, yeah, this thing that they must be paid. Um, otherwise, it's just another form of exploitation. And that was really critical to the process. So they were there, um, acting as professionals, mm -hmm. and contributed to such. And yeah, so it's really, I mean, she's done loads of work in Brent, um, but also worked more broadly uh, with a group uh, called Make Space for Girls, okay. which this comes back to your um, point about expectations. And there are also gendered expectations mm -hmm. over use of space as well. Um, which has kind of like been revealed through her work. Um, so that was a kind of another um, feature. I mean, there was, uh, and this was something that she's commented on, actually girls much more engaged in um, the work we were doing, M mm. want to much more have a, uh, a say, suggesting perhaps that they have been, you know, historically disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. So their contribution was, mm. um, you yeah, know, significant. Mm. So what, seeing as we're talking about the Wembley Park, development site at the moment do you want to give us a little back background on that what is what is that project yeah i do <laughs> I w jane could talk about some stuff but i guess i guess I, <laughs> this was a project i worked on so maybe i'll, I'll give the, the overview but um yeah so um uh so we, we've been working for about eight years no uh, maybe slightly less five five years let's say um with these developers called quintain um who own wembley park um, the commission was to redesign uh, a space called Whitehall Square. Whitehall Square sits next to Wembley Stadium Station. Um, so it's one of two stations that serves uh, the stadium and the wider Wembley Park area. Um, but it, uh, I guess it's it's uh, it's a space of like really um, uh, quite intense and complex um, uh, pressure. Mm. Uh, so, you know, on a match day, when you've got 90,000 people at the stadium, or is that a capacity? 90,000 people at the stadium. Yeah, there's 90,000 people, you know, up to half which can cross um, uh, through this space. Wow. 
Um, so it's how, how can the space kind of function um, uh, with that volume of visitors arriving in actually a quite small window, leaving mm. in an even shorter one, um, uh, you know, with crowd control measures, all that kind of stuff. Um, how can it function for that, but also provide a, uh, a decent public space for, um, you know, the residential buildings that surround it, um, which have children, which have people that want to, you know, have public space to enjoy. Um, so we uh, were taken on, uh, we won a competition to design that space. Um, and uh, quite early on in the process of our design, um, we were introduced to um, Julia King, um, and a group that she'd set up called Seen and Heard, um, which was where she'd already, as, as a result of Brent being the, the bar of culture um, and having set up kind of youth parliaments and um, different groups of young people to try and kind of offer them agency in certain decisions, this Seen and Heard group had emerged um, that were, had identified that, you know, there are certain development sites in London and in, in their borough um, that didn't for them feel like they were welcome. There are lots of kind of new build developments, places where it felt kind of uh, not specific or didn't cater to local community mm. needs, introducing new kind of uh, forms of retail or new new uses that didn't speak to um, the existing context. Um, so we they, they were brought in early in the process um, to talk about the design, to kind of almost act in kind of an apprenticeship fashion. Um, and for, off the back of that, they were involved in developing ideas for other spaces around Wembley Park. Um, uh, we then, as part of this uh, kind of phase development of this this public space, um, delivered one phase. But again, similar to the British Library, we'd allocated in the planning application uh, for this public space an area that just said, you know, to be designed with mm. the uh, community, a- area for co-design. Um, and again, just left it blank. Um, and uh, so phase one was delivered. Phase two um, is where we, is ongoing at the moment. So we've just, you know, very recently been going through this code design process with this group of young people, um, developing uh, proposals for something that is like, you know, both kind of seating space, planting space, gathering space, and play space. Mm-hmm. Um, it has swings, it has kind of things like that. Um, we're now going, we're now about to, we're, we're in the process of drawing it up, tendering that. Um, and the hope is that, you know, when it goes, we get those tenders back, that young group will be brought in again to, you know, almost almost understand the the pressures and complexities of construction. And with inflation, with all this <laughs> stuff, like, can the, they yeah. now afford what was designed? Mm-hmm. And even if they can't, it's still, I think, um, the that process. process is really important That's to great. make people realise that um, it's explained why it doesn't look like mm-hmm. what they designed. Um, hopefully it will look like what they designed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe there'll be opportunities, I mean, slightly easier with a landscape project than with a building project, but to yeah, bring them onto site, help you know, get them engaged in... Um, realising this space. Lots of these people now have gone off to university, some of them are studying architecture, but it's the idea that they've, um, uh, through through Julia's kind of facilitation of this process, they really kind of uh, embrace the idea that they are custodians of this space for younger people. So they're not thinking, oh, I've, you know, it's not finished and I've already left mm. to go to study or left to go and get a job. They uh, recognise that what they've done is a contribution to the kind of health and well-being of um, young, younger generations. Mm. I think that's what she did so successfully um, as communication, com- communicating the value to, to them of what they were doing. Yeah, that's so great because I think that's like, I remember when I, when I went off to study, you know, planning in university, I didn't really know what it was. Like I didn't mm. have yeah, any, yeah. any interface as a, as a young person with the planning system. So I think kind of showing people behind the scenes of how all this stuff works mm. is like, is fantastic. And also the fact that, I mean, architecture specifically is is a very sort of white middle class profession mm. um, in, in terms of the demographics. And I think we we want to be, however we can, encouraging more diverse, yeah. um, more diverse cohort of people to aspire to that profession. Mm. So, I mean, that's key to your research, isn't it, Jane? Mm. I mean, I think it reflected um, from a lot of um, the collaborators in our network, um, a lot of them have uh, invested so much energy and work in apprenticeships, mentoring, and sort of n- maybe not being very opportunistic about it. This is something that you know they just do on the side. But then 
within the sort of framing of the research, we also recognize that that's vital work. So the sort of capacity building that each of us do in you know our professional life, but also in the case of Wembley again, um, sort of building on top of a lot of existing initiatives. Um, so there was the Blueprint Collective, the Brent Borough of Culture, the Brent Youth Parliament. So, and it's not just knowledge, I guess, it's the relationships. So, you know, finding uh, the people who are interested, who would, you know, participate in the process, um, but also their relationships. So, you know, the the um, participants in Whitehorse Square, they probably, you know, speak to their friends about this project, their families, etc. So this sort of rippling effect that hopefully, you know, these maybe smaller projects um, have a, a really significant role to play. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess that also ties in with um, something that Lydia alluded to earlier about the meanwhile aspect that a lot of these projects have or mm -hmm. the sort of, you know, pilot or experimental um, nature of them. Um, it sort of gives a kind of looseness um, to the brief that, you know, there there is a space to maneuver, there might be a space to fail, you know, that it's um, something that is so foreign and avoided in, you know, professional practice, but then I guess give, programming that into, you know, the, the project uh, is critical. Um, and yeah, that's something that we talked a lot about with, like, especially in, with people from the public sector, like from, you know, project management point of view, it's, you know, it's something that's so hard to overcome, you know, like, how do you actually uh, articulate that and also to build that in um, so that you safeguard the, the project in some way? Um, I mean, we used, to, we used to have that saying in the office, didn't we, that was, <laughs> we used to say, our project's never finished, they're, <laughs> they're, they're designed to evolve. And then we were like, oh, yeah, that's got a nice ring to it. So we started saying that, you know, in presentations to, <laughs> to clients. And they used to look on their face, they were like, eh, eh. And they were like, oh, okay, down to it. And then one day, one of them said, you know, that's the what, the last thing uh, a prospective client wants, wants to hear is this project, you know, we want to know, on time, on budget. But, and we're sitting there saying, but they never finish. And it's like, and, but I guess the, you know, <laughs> there is, and I, but I think in a way, I was, I was going to say, you know, that's not what we mean, they do, blah, blah. but actually I think that's one of the problems, isn't it? That things are so packaged up neatly, projects are kind of delivered, bam, finished, like, you know, any landscape is completely, you know, perfect day one. And, and what that means is that, that, that baked into these schemes is um, you know, management and maintenance contracts for the landscape like that. So, like, a resident of New Building cannot affect their landscape because that will then, you know, void the maintenance agreement that they've got or, like, yeah. you know, if they plant their own tree in the street, it's like, oh, no, a tree is more expensive than a paving stone to maintain. Therefore, like, you know, we've voided it. And, and we, I mean, our office is just around the corner from a place called Bonington Square, which was, you know, squat back in the 70s, 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, but is this, I don't know if you've been there, but it's an amazing... Um, uh, 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 yeah, where um, you can enter it via um, a house that the community kind of, like, you know, when it was back in the squat, just opened up the ground floor, made a passageway Whoa. into this courtyard behind. Um, and it's like an absolute jungle of stuff because they just ripped out paving stones, planted things, it's got ferns. It's like, and, um, and that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, maintenance contracts and uh, different sort of, like, public space uh, kind of charters or, or even, you know, the way that public, you know, public... Um, bodies uh, maintain space um, doesn't allow for yeah um, so I think sometimes that um, projects never being finished is something that rather than saying oh we will finish it don't worry <laughs> we should be saying to them why don't you not finish it <laughs> why don't you just not do the plant aspect of it and see what people come along and want to do yeah um, there's almost a you know in a in a pursuit of high quality um, you kind of remove any uh, ability for someone else to you know engage. Yeah. So sort of think d think doing less um, is something uh, that came. That, yeah, it was an observation that came out of what you're talking about. It also highlights the um, something else that came out of the research was the need for a facilitator role yes. or someone who is impartial in the process. So someone mm. who can sit between the very tight deadlines 
from a potential developer perspective, sit between the local authority, the designer, the architect and the local groups and manage the process from an impartial perspective. And which also allows um, the kind of co-design process to be very organic and fluid and to fail and to learn and to try things yeah. um, in relation to the very like strict deadlines of a project development. Mm -hmm. And that role is is crucial and needs to be someone who can sit between these different parties and act as a mm. facilitator in that space. Yeah, so it's really good to hear that actually, because that's something that, that I've done in my role with Design Southeast. Mm. We, just to give a little plug for them, because we do we do exactly that role and our sort of selling point is like, we're a charity, we're a, we work in the public interest and we're, we're independent. And we often come in at that in-between stage as almost as a buffer between yeah. like the community and the, usually it's local authority, could do with a developer as well and be like, look, we all want the best outcome here. You know, yeah. let's not, let's stop the, the sort of adversarial attitude and, you know, try and get everyone working together. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of value in that, whoever, whoever it might be. And this thing, you, you, you know, just sparked a couple of thoughts for me about this thing of letting the community be involved with planting and maintaining their areas, because there's, I think being, having been a little bit involved with London National Park City, mm -hmm. I'm plugged into these, this like network of, of rangers across, across the city who are volunteering, you know, in, in various ways in terms of urban greening and that kind of thing. And something I've heard from many of those, many of them is that there's so much goodwill and so much, uh, you know, local people want to be involved with even just watering their street trees or, mm. you know, growing food somewhere or, you know, doing that sort of activities in nature that you're so disconnected from in a city usually but actually there's lots of institutional barriers in the way yeah. of that happening and I think something I'm keen to work on is to figure out what landowners and developers and local authorities can do to just like unlock all that potential of people to actually make their places so much better and so yeah. much greener um, but also there's good research around the sort of um, having a nature connection and doing activities in nature um, seems to be correlated with pro pro sustainability, pro nature values mm. and 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 lifestyles. Mm. So it's a very difficult thing to measure, but it's sort of a it could could be you know sort of have these reverberations if we can have an urban population that is very um, biophilic and very connected to nature. Actually, what does that mean for their lifestyles and and their how they vote and the kind of yeah. things that they buy and that kind of thing? Yeah, it's very interesting. I think that um, yeah, I I think that our our you know, because I, I, I want to, I guess, kind of stress that the, you know, embedded within this kind of promotion of co-design is um, the belief that it will lead to more sustainable mm. development, more sustainable approaches to things. And I guess one example of that is that when you when you allow people to when you allow people local to an area to take a bit of control or give them a bit of control, even give them you know uh, the financial means, whether that's through uh, you know, rent reductions or kind of you know, tax benefits to um, help make those improvements. You'll more often than not find that they will, you know, buy locally, source locally, things like that. Whereas when you know these things are done as part of you know big, um, you know, term contracts by uh, uh, you know international or kind of uh, mm -hmm. you know, tier one contractor in the UK, mm -hmm. their kind of their uh, source of materials is global. Mm -hmm. um, so I think. Yeah, I, I guess um, that uh, you know it's, it's not not an answer to your question, but I think it's a kind of it's important to recognise that um, yeah that then kind of impact like, in fact kind of like local economies, but it also does lead to more kind of sustainable sourcing materials, um, uh, and uh, yeah taps into that that good kind of goodwill that that does exist. We're sort of getting in getting towards the end here. The last hour has just flown by. Um, <laughs> is there anything we haven't we haven't talked about that we'd like to bring up? Uh, perhaps uh, the thing that we'd want to we want to let everyone know is that the work we're doing hopefully is going to lead to um, a sort of overlay of the RBA plan of work oh, yeah. um, that really is meant to be a guide for you know, architects, designers, but also you know members of the public um, to understand. Where uh, you know best kind of co-design activities um, can uh, take place. Um, as part of that, we're also we've looked at a series of case studies of projects where a really successful participatory design or engagement has taken place, um, and we're going to make these things all you know public and mm. uh, accessible for everyone. Um, 
you know, within the next month or so. Um, I guess an important thing to, I mean, we've, we've talked to so many great people as part of this research um, that deserve lots of recognition. Too many people have perhaps helped us to, mm-hmm. to name them, but um, I think our ambition is just to, of this research, is to make a more equitable um, uh, built environment industry as well as more equitable built environment. Mm-hmm. So the idea of this is that um, all those people out there within the profession that are generous with their time, that essentially kind of work for free to um, push these ideas, and this all be- also becomes a toolkit for them that says, you know, allows them to use mm-hmm. for their clients and say, look, this is a valuable process, this is when it could happen, this is the extent of engagement that it needs to make it effective. Um, so that it doesn't it doesn't rely on you know a certain type of architect or type of designer, um, type of consultant to promote it you know at their expense, but that actually this is kind of you know uh, you know widely accepted as something that brings lots of value. Yeah, yeah. And what would you say maybe as a, as a final question? What would you say to people who need convincing to get in, to get involved with with the co design process or really sceptical about it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lydia. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I just say, just do it. It's always going to lead to better designs, even if the process is hard and takes more time and is more energy, money, everything consuming. It's always going to lead to a better design for the people who use the space. I think there's also maybe... Like those that are struggling to see how co-design fits into the work, um, it's maybe important to see co-design not as that you know, getting your hands dirty stage, which of course it is. But then, co-design can also happen at more strategic stages, which actually has potentially greater impact um, on you know the site or the wider neighborhood. So maybe it's sort of being more imaginative or open to what that co-design process is. Mm-hmm. So if it's a master plan, if it's a local plan, you know, like that, that is also um, co-design in the, in the sense of co-producing um, the work. So, yeah, I, I think the maybe, well, we, we always um, have this question or, or like skeptics might say, you know, is co-design the answer to everything? And I think we can honestly say no. Like, you know, it, it, co-design and also acknowledging that, you know, co- bad co-design can also be detrimental to, you know, trust, right? So it's, um, I guess, you know, co-design comes with responsibility. And, you know, if there is will and space for it, then yes. But then also being very uh, conscious of, you know, like the tokenistic nature that some of these could um, sort of manifest. So, yeah, I I guess that's um, maybe, yeah, co- co-design, do it, uh, but do it with care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess my, for my two pennies worth, <laughs> I guess, I guess the, the narrative that we're being fed at the moment just seems so divisive. Mm. It's always about like, you know, them, us, about... Um, you know, uh, it's about borders, it's about kind of like, you know, taking back control, it's about kind of stopping boats. And it just feels like this is, um, you know, this is the least sustainable, kind of least appropriate kind of narrative to be taking right now. And I think um, I heard someone say recently, um, and I can't remember who it was, but that there are so many people trying to be understood that we forget the importance of remembering to understand. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that... um, you know, the listeners to to your podcast are clearly going to be interested in, you know, environmental approaches to to urbanism. I think the 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 takeaway that I would want to leave people with is that there is no environmental justice without social justice, and this is a process that we're trying to promote as one that embeds um, social value, that empowers people that are you know, otherwise disenfranchised from the built environment, um, that shares knowledge with those people. And that um, you know, grants agency and decision making powers to those that are you know you know too frequently forgotten. Mm. Um, 
So, you know, as part of a kind of a, a wider framework or toolkit for working towards an environmentally just future, um, this has to be one of those tools. Lovely. What a, what a great way to end the podcast. Thank you all. Thank you all so Thank much. You. It's been a great chat.